Well, let me uh, welcome you all to the Woodrow Wilson Center. Uh, my name is Kent Hughes. I direct a program here at the Center on America and the Global Economy. Uh, we look at globalization, we look at innovation, and in the long run future, the American economy. And when you ask people about the strengths and weaknesses, they have a long list of strengths, and you say, what about the weaknesses? They often say, well, we need to do more on K-12 education in general and STEM education in particular. So that, in turn, has led us to discover people like Tim Spock and the distinguished members of this panel who have really, in many ways, been our professors of education as we've explored this subject over the last four years. Before I say a word about the Wilson Center, I just want to introduce a couple people. Liz Byers there, let, raise your hand, Liz, is a real force behind what we do as a program associate, and her portfolio includes STEM education. And Georgina Allison, Georgina waved to everyone. Georgina's been interning with us. Her internship is technically over, but when she heard we were doing something on STEM education, she interrupted her exam week to come in and, uh, and lend us a hand. Uh, let me just say a word about the Woodrow Wilson Center for those of you who are new to us. In 1968, Congress wanted to honor the 28th president, but instead of another marble statue or monument on the mall, they created this living memorial. Our assignment was to capture both sides of Wilson's life. He was the only president to have earned a PhD, and in his era was a very prominent and widely recognized political scientist. He went on to be, among other things, the football coach at Wesleyan, but more distinguished uh, yet was his role as president of Princeton University, governor of New Jersey, and then, of course, a two-term president. They wanted us to bring together that academic policy research side of his life together with his role of actually making public policy. So that's what we try to do here, is to bring together some of the best thinkers. We have them assembled here on today's panel as well as people, and again, we have them on this panel with a depth of research and really making change uh, to, uh, to make this a, a better opportunity for their students and really for the country as a whole. Over the course of a year, we'll have 150 people come here to do research on public policy. We have programs here that cover really every part of the world and then a number like my own that are cross-cutting in nature. So we often collaborate if we look at let's say, education in Brazil, I would work with our Brazil Institute, and we would do the education piece, and he would do the Brazil piece. Well, let me introduce today's panel, which is just absolutely almost intimidating, I would say, for the, for the extent of their education and their depth of experience. It's certainly, speaking as a country boy from Oregon, it's certainly intimidating to me. I'm going to introduce them alphabetically, even though they really aren't sitting quite alphabetical order. Uh, I'm going to start with Richard Boone, who's uh, to my right, far right, you're far left there. Uh, Richard is a uh, professor of echo. In fact, I can bear, uh, th this is such an intimidating panel, I can barely understand the majors that they, uh, that they <laughs> have their current roles. He's professor of ecosystems ecology, the Department of Biology and Wildlife in the Institute of Arctic Biology, University of Alaska, Fairbanks. What is also intriguing to me is that he coordinates a group of a really 120 institutions that really constitute a, a focus on the Arctic. So with, uh, he's currently doing a, a stint at the National Science Foundation, but I, seeing this focus on the Arctic and so forth, I'm wondering if Richard Boone isn't a direct descendant of Daniel. Apparently so. <laughs> really? Well, my goodness, I've, this is even more impressive. Uh, I've learned how to say this correctly, Danell. Thank you. Hogan, uh, to my uh, far uh, left and your far right. She's a physics teacher. She is from uh, Idaho, part of the glorious Northwest, with experience at the Idaho National Laboratory and uh, the Idaho STEM Competition Organizing Committee, where there really are, it's wonderful as you get around the country to see how many initiatives are taking place at the state level or, or local level. Uh, Dave Oberling, where is Dave? It's oh, right next to me, my goodness, <laughs> gee whiz, this is, I do need a new prescription, that's clear. Uh, another biologist uh, on the panel, he's mentored graduate students, uh, he's uh, got a great deal of experience with 
teacher-scientist partnerships, which we're looking at today. And he is at the Department of Energy in the Office of Science, their Workforce Development for Teachers and Scientists, which is right on target for today's uh, subject. It's also a reminder of how widely spread the interest is in, in, the, uh, in an administration. So you have people at uh, Defense, National Science Foundation, NASA, Department of Energy, all of whom are concerned about the question of how do we foster the kind of partnerships between teachers and scientists that will drive education and enrich the ability of scientists to communicate. Next, I want to introduce an old friend, an Einstein fellow with a whole series of awards. Uh, we were blessed to have Senator Moynihan come to us after he retired and, and spent some time with us before he, he passed on. And we often had to say about him that he had written more books than most of us had read. Uh, Tim, I think, has more awards than I can, would have time to, uh, to count on. And he's really helped us put together uh, this session for today. And Horace Walcott, uh, also to my left and, and your right, he is, uh, works at, uh, with students at Brooklyn Technical, uh, Technical High School. He has co-published with his students. He's filed for patents. You can see why I'm a little intimidated here on the panel. And uh, this has intrigued me. He has a Master's of Science in Wild Animal Health. Uh, that could be particularly applicable to today's uh, Washington, D.C. <laughs> and to my right and your immediate left, Sarah Young. Uh, she is from uh, Utah, but did her initial education at the University of Colorado Boulder, where my younger son went, and my daughter's now in law school there, so we have a lot of Colorado ties. She is, uh, just to show you the breadth of what our panel is doing, in addition to focusing on the local, state, and national level, she's at the International Division at the National Science Foundation. Well, let me, uh, again, welcome you all. Welcome the panel. Thank you very much for coming. This uh, topic is something that's really of enormous importance, although sometimes it doesn't make the everyday headlines. It's the question of how do we really not only enrich the career opportunities and firsthand sense of science for people who are in the classroom, at the same time we need desperately to master an ability for people with advanced technical training, your PhD in physics for instance, to be able to communicate effectively to Washington, D.C., to state capitals, to the people at large, so their, their knowledge can, in fact, be spread around the country. Well, I wanted to start today just with a few questions, and I want to thank Tim particularly, I was saying earlier, that for sending me a lesson plan. And I've got, a, of course, a couple <laughs> questions uh, of my own. I just uh, wonder if maybe I'll start with you, Tim, because uh, you've done a lot of thinking about this, as I'm sure the rest of the panel has. What, uh, what got you thinking about these partnerships between scientists and, say, K-12 teachers, and what do you think makes an effective partnership? And then I'd like the rest of you or whoever would like to weigh in after Tim has a couple minutes. Um, I guess what got me thinking about it, it goes back to, to my background of uh, experiencing these partnerships. Um, currently with a couple NASA projects, NASA IPAC Teachers Archival Research Program, uh, Spitzer Space Telescope Research Program for teachers and students where we've uh, done some work and we've, we've published, we've uh, identified some young, uh, new discoveries, new young-like stars in their early stages of development. Uh, I go back to, you know, I had an, an experience at Lawrence Berkeley National Labs, and that was one that, that kind of uh, came into mind very, very strongly in, in recent days. Uh, Saul Perlmutter uh, won the Nobel Prize in Physics uh, for his work on uh, identifying that the universe is in an accelerated period of expansion. And it just so happened that during my experience at Lawrence Berkeley National Labs through what would have been, uh, I guess, similar to an ACTS program at the Department of Energy, I had a chance to actually work with, with Saul. And we got him to share his data that he used to win the Nobel Prize to begin uh, one of the first ever really uh, national student research programs 
and it was called the Hands on Universe Asteroid Search. And as a result of that search, I had students who were making discoveries of new asteroids. One of them, uh, they helped co-discover one of the first 100 Kuiper Belt asteroids orbiting out near Pluto. And it was just intriguing to me to think that the exact same data set that Saul uh, was using to win the Nobel Prize in Physics, uh, he shared with us at that time so that we could find the asteroids and he was finding the exploding stars. And so I think that uh, was, was one of the things that really got me thinking more about this. And the idea of, of successful partnerships, it's just that. It's a partnership. It can't just be a, a one-shot deal. It's, a, it's an opportunity where people have a chance to work together over an extended period of time. And out of that, you develop a relationship. And the teacher or the educator really begins to understand what it means to be a scientist, what it means to be a researcher, what it means to be an engineer. And the scientist really understands what it means to uh, effectively communicate the message or effectively communicate uh, the science that they're doing. And both of those things are vitally important to the advancement of STEM education in this country. How about the rest of you? I suspect there's been some personal experience that has gotten you interested in this question. Anybody? How about Donnell? Yeah, so now that I, I've learned to say her name correctly, <laughs> I'm so pleased to use it. So I actually didn't participate or have not yet participated in research programs as a teacher, um, but I had a lot of research experience as an undergraduate, and that really uh, made me value the lab experience and, and actually participating in relevant and real research. And that has really helped me push my students into positions where they can do the same. And I think one of the most important consequences of students, in particular, having those experiences is their vision of themselves changes so that when you ask them, you know, what does a scientist look like? They generally, when they begin, will point to somebody else, maybe you as their teacher or uh, a scientist they might see on the television, and say, well, that's what a scientist looks like. And at the end of those experiences, they see themselves as the scientist. And that, I think, is a really important consequence of programs like these, is that you're, you're changing that, their own vision of themselves from it's something that somebody else does, it's an identity that somebody else has to their own identity. And I think that that's very important and is likely why so many of them then continue on into, into STEM-related fields. Horace, what about you? What got you, uh, what's your personal experience on this? I, I would say that the seeds were, were sown in, the in 1992 when I was doing graduate research at Tulane University. I was asked to mentor one undergraduate and uh, one high school student uh, who were rotating through uh, my professor's lab. And we were developing uh, a system or bioassay to detect low levels of carcinogens using the life cycle stages of a fish from Japan called the Japanese medaka. And I could see the uh, the effect it had on the students. And I kept in touch with the students on and off. And uh, one student became a cardiologist, and one student uh, got into medicine. And then I continued my uh, academic quest or pursuits. And uh, my sister, when I graduated from the University of London, and I was awaiting professorships and getting impatient, getting impatient uh, told me, uh, why don't you uh, teach science in New York City? They're looking for great science teachers. And uh, I said, I'll give it a try. And at that time, I was about to present my research that I did at the University of London uh, at the uh, American Association of Veterinary Pathologists meeting. And I remembered as I was leaving, one of my colleagues 
who was a PhD geophysicist and also teaching at the school where I was teaching, he said, well, you know, this is the last of any chance you're going to have for your professional development because from now you're just going to be in the classroom. And it sort of got me a little bit scared. I said, I don't think that's going to happen to me because I'm quintessentially a lab rat and I just simply like to be in the lab and doing experiments wherever I am. And I said, <laughs> it's just not going to happen with me. And uh, at around that time, the Columbia University was, uh, Columbia University Research Program was advertising for teachers to do some research. And I said to myself, I may be, I'm, 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 I may be uh, overqualified for it, but I'll still give it a try. Because uh, as far as I'm concerned, if you are teaching science, whether you're teaching science at the university level or you're teaching science at a high school level, you've got to practice what you teach. In other words, science should not just be, be taught from the textbook. Science should be taught from what's happening in the lab. And there should be some engagement of the students in that process. And so I got into the program at Columbia, and uh, it was just very infectious. And uh, I liked it a lot. It enabled me to, to go back into the lab and do research and establish that type of continuity that I was having at the university. And so uh, that just, it, it just simply accumulated. But I would say that what I found is that it, it enabled the students to, to become hooked in science because of three C's that are used by educators in cooperative education. And surprisingly, it's also a technique that's used for recruiting uh, gang members. And those three C's are capable, contributing, and connected. When you get students involved in scientific research and they can see how hypotheses are developed and they can be part of the development of hypotheses themselves, they feel that they are capable. They feel that they are contributing to science and they feel connected to science. And it just simply hooks them, and they just want to do science. And, and as a result of that, I started an after-school program at Brooklyn Tech. And uh, fortunately, Brooklyn Tech has a very strong alumni association. And I've been supported by their faculty grant uh, program for the last nine years. Thank you, that's intriguing. Dave? Yeah, f uh, first, I'd like to thank you all for being here and for Kent and, and Tim um, to set this up. This is, this, this, these partnerships, I feel like if we get this right, it will do an awful lot to advance STEM education uh, in the United States. My experience with this um, has been with several uh, programs uh, in Missoula, Montana, uh, a couple of them local or state level programs, but probably the most significant one is uh, working with a GK-12 program uh, through the University of Montana. And uh, is with that program um, that we worked uh, with graduate fellows that came into the schools and were partnered with myself and another uh, a science educator over the course of a year. The focus of that program was mostly about outdoor ecological research. And uh, I have for years and years as a biology teacher looked for every possible opportunity to get my students out of the classroom. Um, uh, as, as Horace just said, if, they're, if, if they are engaged in real world experiences uh, rather than um, doing seat time, uh, they tend to become a little bit more engaged. And 
Well, all of this ultimately is about student engagement and uh, getting kids more interested in the possibilities of science, both in the kind of research they can do and also in the kind of careers that are potentially available to them. There's a twist on this that, um, that the, the others haven't brought up so much, and that is that the scientists themselves really benefit from this an awful lot, too. And uh, this is a, a real positive piece of the STEM enterprise. So um, most science researchers are required to focus on their particular uh, area of discovery research. The reason that's so important, of course, is because through publication and through um, funding, uh, that helps them to promote uh, along the, the academic ladder and along the status ladder for their particular field. So there's not a lot of incentive for them to be involved with, um, with the teaching side of, of STEM education. But it's, it's, there have been a few studies that have demonstrated that the, the um, scientists do a lot better even at their own research after they've been involved with teaching it. And I think for those of us who have been educators know that we tend to get to know our subject a little bit better when we have to explain it to somebody else. So this is a, this is a powerful model um, even for the science community. And uh, we've had, we had really tremendous experiences in that way with, um, with the graduate fellows coming in initially and just really having a struggle trying to explain their research first to the teachers and then, of course, to the students. But uh, you really saw them grow into that ability to explain things to the level of the students and to help the teachers gain the kind of content knowledge that was going to help them into the future. So uh, that piece, I think, is really critically important. It helps develop that vertical structure of the STEM enterprise, and uh, that's a piece that we really want to facilitate and develop so that that cutting-edge research uh, that, the, that the, the STEM professionals have and are generating also gets down into the, the uh, STEM education piece in K-12. And Sarah, what's led you in this direction? So I had the opportunity as an educator to participate in the Academy's Creating Teacher Scientists program with the Department of Energy. Um, it brought educators to work in national laboratory sites. I had the opportunity to work at the Thomas Jefferson facility in Newport News, Virginia. Um, focusing on giving us that hands-on science experience. As a young educator, I have to say most of my education coursework and being prepared as a teacher was focused on standards. Um, it was focused on being able to promote these ideas of building the foundation of science for our students. Being put in an ac the academy and being able to actually work in a lab with a research scientist shifted my focus from teaching the history of science to teaching science as the future. Um, and I have to say that those direct science process opportunities that I had really changed my outlook on how I was going to best engage and promote that future in science with younger students. And as again, as, as a young teacher, it was really a moment in my career that changed my ability not only to reach kids, but my ability to be a leader in the, in the world of education. So I can't speak enough to the difference it's made for me personally, for my students, um, and just having that opportunity to promote the future of science and science as a process as opposed to a historical approach. Richard. I think for me, uh, one of the main issues that drove me in this direction was frustration. Um, as a scientist, as a faculty member, going into the classroom, working with teachers, sometimes in a short workshop setting, and realizing that the long-term value is probably minimal. And I really believe the longer-term partnership has the greatest value for teacher education, also for K-12 student learning. Um, before um, coming to NSF, I also was the PI of a GK-12 program. And what I saw was the importance of a sustained partnership um, between a scientist and a K-12 educator in terms of providing long-term value. And as an example, I'll tell a, real, a short story. Um, 
we have a summer institute at the start of our, our, our academic year for our new teachers in the GK-12 program and for our new graduate fellows. And uh, we had introductions and uh, one of our teachers, a uh, third grade teacher has been teaching for about five or six years said that not only um, did she, was she a creative science but she didn't teach it at all in her third grade class. I was quite shocked at that uh, because I thought that every teacher would at least try to teach science even if they weren't comfortable with it, but she confessed that she simply avoided it, did not teach science at all. Um, so fast forward a year, uh, a year later she's had a fellow working with her five hours a week in the classroom, a graduate student in science. So we shared stories at the end of the year and she said, well you know, she said not only did I realize that science is fun, but I can do it myself now. And for me, what that really represents is the value of the sustained partnership. Well, all of this is, I find, very persuasive. Uh, Dave, I think you were saying that it really helps the scientist articulate the, in some cases, the underlying assumptions. I remember, I believe it was Prince Kropotkin who once said, if you really understood something, you could s explain it to the simplest Russian peasant. Yet in any discipline, I have more of a law and economics background. And sometimes I'll be asked to explain an assumption that we all take for granted. And by doing that, certainly it sharpens your understanding and it forces the scientist to be much more articulate with his or her discipline. All of you, however, had kind of a serendipitous exposure to this. And the NSF, I know, has tried to take the next step and set up a program that would expand that opportunity. Is that enough? What, what would be the best way to make sure that almost every K through 12 science teacher had an opportunity to have that firsthand experience and that excitement of being in the lab and then as you said Sarah start not teaching the history of what we know but the the future as a as a really a, an element of discovery well I'll go ahead and, and kind of take a, a shot at that um, you know, certainly we, you know, one of the things with the sustained partnerships is, of course, the cost. Uh, but I think as an educator, and I've been through a lot of different types of programs. I've been through the programs where they've been the one-day workshop. I've been through the programs where they've been a two-day workshop, a one-week workshop. Uh, and then I've been through the programs that have been extended and have, have been, uh, you know, a, a sustained partnership. And... Uh, what I've come to the conclusion, uh, or I've come to the conclusion that I would much rather have, you know, 50 teachers have be transformed, you know, to get over the plateau and actually be able to function up here for the rest of their lives as a STEM educator um, than I would have. Uh, you know, 500 teachers be exposed to something for a day where they never get up over the threshold. They, there might be a little bit of a blip and then they're right back down. And so I think that when we look at programs, um, we tend to look at numbers of people touched or numbers of people that have been, that have, have, have been related to the experience in one way or another. And we don't necessarily look at what's the real change that's been made that have we pushed them over the threshold? I think both Dave and Rich have, have hit this nicely. The sustained partnerships with, the, for example, the GK-12 program have pushed teachers up over the threshold, and they can function as a teacher scientist for the rest of their career. And how many students will they impact? All right. And then if you take a look at uh, other kinds of initiatives where they're more single-day or two-day types of programs, uh, the impact is is not really there. Uh, so many times teachers will go back in the classroom and, and they're just, they don't feel that they've got the support structure in place and so they just don't use it. And that's the reality out there. So I think that's, that's one thing. We need to be looking at programs that have these sustained partnerships and understand that it's a big investment initially up front, but once we get the, the teacher over the threshold, uh, we have made progress for the rest of their career. I guess the other kinds of programs that we could look at then are programs that target teachers in their early, in their, uh, their teacher preparation programs. You know, we're to NSF, for example, has a research experience for undergraduates. Perhaps, uh, you know, the research experience for undergraduates should be expanded and um, you could go ahead and, and actually target, 
uh, pre-service teachers. There might be new models of, of a, a GK-12 program that you built on the successes because, of course, that program is being phased out right now, uh, where you look at, uh, you know, pairing up graduate students with uh, educators or with uh, undergraduate students during their student teaching experience so that during their student teaching experience they actually have the education consultant being the classroom teacher and they have the science consultant being the graduate student. I think there are, you know, there are lots of uh, opportunities or lots of possibilities. Right now we're looking at a program that's in the UK and I'm going to ask Sai here in a little bit to just uh, talk about that called STEMnet where they actually have uh, regions and they have a, a, an individual there that's a liaison between the scientific community and the education community. They train the scientific community, turn them into what are called STEM ambassadors, and those STEM ambassadors go in the classroom uh, via the liaison uh, to work with teachers and students. That might be a model that we could look at here in, in the United States. And with that, I'll, you know, I'll anybody else has that if I if I can just follow up on that as well you know there are so many places in our country that have schools of education and they have schools of science and engineering and mathematics those are places where you have teachers who are being trained as well as scientists who are at work in the laboratory um, they're on the same campus and yet those two programs tend to run completely separate from one another. I think being able to bring kind of communication and connections even within a university to be able to, you know, kind of co-support each other from the education piece as well as from the science and experiential piece would be incredibly valuable, not just to our teachers, but to the future of our students. Well, uh, Morris, I what I would like to add is that the the teacher scientist as a person or someone in the American culture needs to be needs to be supported and needs to be propagated, just like the physician scientist. There needs to be funding for those kinds of teachers, and every high school in the United States should have several teacher scientists who are supported by the by the district, by the uh, by legislature, and I think when that is done, those individuals who are already having an impact on students will have a more increased uh, impact on students. And I say this from, from my own personal experience because uh, I consider myself a teacher scientist because I'm not just a teacher and I'm not just a scientist, but I deliberately and it's not being self-righteous, but I can speak for some of my other colleagues. We, and, and I'm not saying I, but we deliberately practice what we teach, and we go into the lab deliberately and conduct research and encourage our students to do the same. And I'm talking about the Partners in Science program that is that has been supported by the Murdoch Charitable Trust. I am a partner in science in that program. We meet every winter in San Diego, California. We present our recent research activities of, of our students and the young partners, the ones who are starting the program for the first two years, they are actually in the lab, in a university lab, conducting research, and they present their data at a platform session and also as a, uh, as a poster. But the veteran partners do have a chance to present their data as a poster. And I, I do that deliberately every year because uh, it, 
it gets the work of my students uh, noticed on a national scale, and that helps the students because they can see that their work is having an impact on everyday science. Of course, I suspect the incentives of going from Brooklyn to San Diego may have <laughs> something to do with it. <laughs> can I just add, uh, just really quickly, some numbers to this? Um, Sarah participated in the ACTS program. That's the Academy's Creating Teacher Scientists. That was a Department of Energy program uh, through the Office of Science and Workforce Development for Teachers and Scientists. At the time, uh, that went from 2004 to 2010, and there were about 400 teachers who participated in that program uh, with uh, researchers at the national laboratories. So I think there were, oh, about a dozen national labs that supported that program. So we just estimated some numbers. If there were about 120 or so teachers a year uh, over the course of that uh, seven-year period. And then if we extrapolated that forward to about 2015, the teachers in that program would have contact by the time 2015 arrived with over half a million students, somewhere close to 600,000. Now, of course, the, the research hasn't been done to see whether that contact translates to uh, impact and, and better student learning or better student engagement or more awareness of students of, of uh, STEM careers or those students moving on to, um, to a higher education in, in uh, STEM focus. But nonetheless, that, the, the amount of contact there is impressive. This sounds absolutely compelling to me, but I know there are many instances in which it's simply going to be hard to reach every teacher and reach every teacher uh, every day. I wonder if, let me ask, bring Donnell and Richard into the conversation. Both of you come from areas where there's a substantial number of rural schools and probably harder to reach. Is there a way that we could have virtual laboratories that you could engage online in a serious research that would stimulate some of that, that firsthand science experience that could translate into the classroom? Now let me start with you. So absolutely, I think there are a lot of instances where um, there are resources available online, data sets, for instance, that Tim was uh, referring to earlier, that are out there and available for real uh, relevant research that other uh, professors would be interested in, but teachers don't know how to utilize those resources or they're not user friendly. Um, and so again, establishing partnerships, even if they're virtual in terms of your um, interaction with those professors is is definitely important and can be beneficial even in those rural areas. Um, and we definitely struggle with that in Idaho. We even for our state science competition allow uh, students to present virtually at the state level competition because Idaho is huge and getting everybody to come to one place is, is, defi is definitely a challenge. So um, I think that's one um, strategy that can definitely be used and is being used more often. Also, you know, bringing um, presenters into the classroom via Skype or other technologies. So recently, I've been Skyping with my students back in Idaho to get them involved with uh, a NASA program that we're working on here. Um, and that's been great, and our students love it. They, they obviously love the use of technology. They're much, much better at it than um, most of their teachers and parents. And, so, and, and it's exciting to them to be able to interact with people that normally wouldn't be available to them. And we're looking at Skyping in uh, presenters for a lecture series that we have at our school as well, which then just opens up a whole new, um, a whole new realm of, of presenters that might be able to actually come in and interact with your students. Um, so yeah, I think that th there's definitely resources out there that could be used, especially in rural communities. And I think also really trying to look for those place-based partnerships, because oftentimes we think in those rural areas that there isn't science going on, but there oftentimes is a lot of really valuable, interesting science going on that, that teachers could partner with. So um, I'd like to go back to what Tim said about having a liaison. I think that really is vitally important, whether it's at the state level or the district level. But you know, teachers are very busy and, as we know, um, have a very long list of things to do on their work plate, as are research scientists who are you know, ever chasing funding and, and conducting their own research. So I, I really think the value of having a liaison who is purposefully trying to 
to make those connections, maintain those connections, and find new connections is really important. Thank you, thank you. Richard, how about uh, Alaska's got a big state, not that many people. And actually, one of the misperceptions is that we're rural. In fact, most of us live in urban areas. Most Alaskans are urbanites. Well, we've all learned a lot about Wasilla recently. I know, I know, which is <laughs> quite small. I guess one point I'd make about uh, rural connections is that it's hard to support original research in the classroom via remote connections. That's our experience. Um, one way around that is the use of very high quality kits. Um, but an important component of that is the support um, for the teacher in the classroom. And there are many kits that are never used. Um, there are many kits um, that uh, teachers have difficulty using effectively. And so I think an important component of using a kit which allows for remote delivery uh, from a university setting potentially is training and also um, a connection with the teacher um, before and after the lesson is delivered. Um, but I, I think that online labs are still problematic uh, in many fields. And I think there's some problems to be solved there, especially for biology. But kids is one way, but they have to be high quality and there has to be support for them when the teachers use them. Ken, I just wanted to make one real quick comment. I think that there is, there's some combination there, but my experience and from what I've seen with, with limited research that I've done in this area is that um, there needs to be some personal contact. There needs to, you really need to have some initial personal contact. And then you can go to the webinars and you can go to the, uh, the Skyping and that sort of thing. If you've got a, a there's, there might be some combination where the scientist is going in the classroom, interacting face to face with the kids, but then certainly follow up Skyping and video conferencing and then them coming back into the classroom. It's all about sustained long-term contact. But there, not, there does, I think students do need to see that this is a real person and they need that person face to face at least for some limited amount of time. You know, one of the things that is, appears to be growing in the United States is an interest in project-based learning, where there is a, or a discovery-based learning, which, where you're not just, as you put it, learning history, but you're discovering how to put this robot together, thinking of first robotics as an example. Is project-based learning a potential complement to the idea of having that excitement of actually discovering something as a, as a scientist would? I, if I can jump in, I think absolutely the answer is yes, and I, I think the key word is ownership. Um, the students take ownership of the project, of the investigation, and that ownership is a key component, I think, to effective learning. Well, let me jump to one last question before you've all been very patient. I know you I know, see some familiar faces, some Einsteins in the uh, audience, and I want to call on them, too. We're in the midst of a difficult budget season in Washington. Uh, federal government is now operating on its second continuing resolution. There's hope that there will be another. There's been a minibus. Some of the bills have passed. There's a, now talk about an omnibus where everything will be put together. In that mix, this is a, the current program is relatively small, but how do we justify, how do you make the case for it? Dave was mentioning there's a potential to measure impact, but hasn't been done yet. And there's so many competing interests. There's very little, unfortunately, that's really waste, fraud, and abuse. It's this, I want to do a little bit more than this other good thing here. This seems to be something that would have enormous long-term leverage in terms of stimulating the kind of STEM education that we need. How do we make that case? Let's pretend that we have the Appropriations <coughs> Committee sitting out in front of us. I'm going to jump in here and disagree with my colleague Dave, or, or maybe he just hasn't gotten to this <laughs> yet. I haven't said anything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the is it, is the, there, do we have a track record? <laughs> is that what you're trying to say? Well, this, this, this is beginning to sound like a congressional hearing. It would be to the senator. I would say my good friend. <laughs> uh, but I think, you know, there, there's a limited body of research, and I think that's, that's for sure. But there is a fair amount of research. You know, there was a study that was, you know, the New York Regency exams have been around for, for many years. Uh, there was a study that was done, a very good study that was done, that looked at uh, teachers who had an RET experience, a research experience for teachers. And they looked at the impact of student performance on the Regency exam 
three years out after the, uh, the, the teacher had the RET experience and had that partnership and had that, that sort of uh, an opportunity, opportunity. And what they found is that the students who had teachers who, who had that RET experience performed significantly better on the Regency exam. And so I think that that was a very solid study that we can build on. I also think that, you know, you take a look at a, a lot of the work that's been done as far as the research on the, the impact of uh, these experiences on scientists as far as their communication skills. Uh, there's been research done that demonstrates pretty clearly uh, that uh, communication skills impre improve uh, for graduate students, for scientists who have these, these experiences. Uh, you, you also have, I think, uh, the teacher, the impact on the teacher. I know there have been a couple studies been done on, for example, the GK-12 program and what the impact has been on, on teacher as far as their professional development. And one study looked at having these graduate students go into the classroom uh, for a, a, a year and uh, they then looked at the, well, prior to that, they looked at the teacher's use of inquiry and constructivist uh, sort of approach in, in, in instruction. And then they looked at it two years after um, the teacher had ended their GK-12 experience and their inquiry skills, their con the constructivist approach uh, was sustained. It was not something, there was a significant growth and then it was sustained two years out. And I think if we can get something sustained two years out in, a, in an educator, most of us would probably agree that's a career changer. So I think there's a, and actually the handout that's, that's there, I think you folks have, has at least a sample of some of the research. Uh, Let me turn uh, out to this distinguished gentleman from Montana. <laughs> <laughs> So we'll I, I, I agree with Tim. I, I, I'm not sure, Tim, that it was me that said that there were, had been absolutely no impact studies, but, um, and, and those are certainly important examples. I would also recommend uh, reading the GK-12 technical report because there's a lot of interesting self-report data there from teachers, uh, fellows, uh, the PIs in charge of the programs, and uh, research advisors for the graduate fellows all of it indicates um, substantial benefit uh, from participating in this long-term professional development program. And I say professional development both for teachers and for the graduate students and scientists as well. So um, I think that presents a, a b baseline to generate some really interesting research going forward. And there's a call for that kind of research in the uh, new framework for the science standards. There's a significant piece in there about how an awful lot more research on uh, science teaching and learning needs to be done going forward to, um, to help us understand uh, how, we, how we get at helping kids learn this um, sometimes difficult but certainly interesting material. Now I want to take this a slightly different direction. So uh, in the PCAST report, um, this was on developing um, uh, uh, the STEM enterprise and STEM educators. They call for 100,000 STEM educators. Uh, there's indications in, uh, in that report that uh, preparing a group of master teachers might be important. We know from some of the economic stuff, and Kent, you could probably speak much better than I can to this, that scientists, even though they represent only about 5% of the workforce, they generate something like 90% of the economy and, and innovation in the economy. So we can't afford to, to, um, to lose this battle. So this idea of generating these 100,000 uh, qualified and excellent STEM educators is really important. So if I'm speaking to uh, policy folks on the Hill, these two things go together hand in hand. And while we like to uh, think about being efficient and spending our money wisely, it, this is kind of a no-brainer. This is, this is a wise uh, expenditure to partner researchers and educators. Uh, the, the research uh, on the Regents exam, that, that paper was published in Science uh, several years ago. It was authored by uh, Loike, Dubner, and Silverman, Silverstein. And Dr. Silverstein is a practicing scientist, a physiologist, uh, 
who is now retired at uh, Columbia University. But I would say uh, one, one incentive is national security. But I'm sure the politicians have heard that several times and heard that more than 40 years. But it's national security in this respect. Uh, taking exams, solving everyday problems, that only uh, taps into a certain percentage of a student's intelligence. There is a need today for more of that intelligence to be tapped into because the problems that a youth has to face as an up-and-coming scientist is much more challenging than the individuals who are currently tenured professors. And it requires another level or type of intelligence, a type of intelligence that uh, Dr. One professor at, uh, in the, at the University of Manchester defined as kinetic intelligence in which this, the, the, the current scientist, the young PhD, the aspiring uh, high school student has to, has to basically deal with paradigm shifts. And that requires a special kind of intelligence, and it can be cultivated, it can be nurtured, but it takes teachers who are teacher scientists to nurture that type of intelligence, which is hidden in our youths. It takes that kind of teacher to bring that out in a student but it is of national security importance because if it is not done for American students, other countries will do the same and acquire technological and other superiority over the United States and tip the balance of power in a way that the politicians have never seen before. To follow up Horace's comment, we've been meeting as part of our STEM initiative with Andrea Slicer periodically, who analyzes the PISA exams for the OECD, the Program on International Student Assessment. And in passing, he has demonstrated that 10 years ago, the United States had more four-year college graduates relative to its population than any other country. Ten years forward, we've made a little progress. We're now number eight. That other countries are focused, in fact, on the very innovation system that has made the United States such an innovative and prosperous and secure uh, country. And that has certainly driven me back to thinking about STEM. What, let's have the last comment from Sarah, and then we'll go to your question. Yeah, I was just going to say, in terms of building on that idea, I think a lot of these programs build upon resources that we already have present. It's not a question of creating something completely new. You're not asking to start a completely new laboratory with completely new resources, with completely new scientists. Um, you know, you're looking at the research that's already happening that we're promoting as a country and to invest a little bit more to get teachers in on that, to have students then more prepared for their future, utilizing those resources that we as a country have already invested in, I think makes sense. Well, let me open up uh, to your questions. Lady right here. And if you we're just we have a microphone coming if you could just then tell us who you are and maybe an institutional affiliation yeah hi before thank you, you do let me introduce Clark Taylor who was out of the room when I introduced people Clark's also with the page program and does a lot on innovation and entrepreneurship thank you my name is Diane Clayton and Richard might recognize me as Diane Schweitzer 
Yeah, that's me. <laughs> so I, I work for Valador and I provide support to Office of Education at NASA. And we are very interested in um, working on this type of program where we have scientists and researchers engaging with students, educators, and even more broadly the public. And I'm wondering from the, the successful programs out there if there's a, a common thread among the responsibilities. What are the responsibilities of the key players, meaning the organization, the scientists, the teachers, the schools, especially my personal interest is this long term, the long term engagement. Is there is there a common thread on, on really what those roles are? Uh, there, there is, and uh, the, the degree of intensity varies from one organization to the other organization. If we take the Partners in Science program that is, that is funded by the, Mart, the MJ, uh, Mordock Charitable Trust in the Northwest. Uh, it is a very sustained program that has been going on for more than two decades. And what it does, it, it puts teachers in the pipeline to become teacher scientists, whereby uh, they spend two years, two summers, it's not really two summers, but it's actually two years doing research with a scientist. And uh, every year they get the opportunity to meet with other teacher scientists in San Diego, but also to be able to be in contact with those teacher scientists. And uh, the first two years you are they pay for your airfare and your room and board to spend two days in San Diego, two or three days in San Diego. And it's not just all conference and chatting and, uh, and, and brainy activities. You also get to see the city and activities like those. But what also happens is the veteran partners, they are they pay their own airfare, and some people will pay their own airfare, airfares, but their room and board is paid <coughs> for by the Murdoch Charitable Trust, and they've been doing that for several years. But what they also do, they invite Nobel laureates and distinguished scientists to give lectures on the most current topics to the whole group, and they also have workshops conducted by partners as well as other scientists for the teachers who participate in the program. There is also a program that, uh, that Siemens has started called the Siemens STARS program, whereby teachers for two weeks uh, work with scientists at the Oak Ridge Na National Laboratory and they, they sort of have a taste or of the menus of the different types of science that they can get into, but also uh, the potential for future collaboration with uh, teachers, with teachers and scientists. And I would also like to mention the SMART program at NYU Poly, of which I am. Um, currently a participant, uh, that is also one in which there is a lot of sustaining, but then the issue becomes the financial support. Intel ho also now has a program that they have started where they're training teachers to be mentors so that students can actually conduct research in a lab and <coughs> our program at, uh, at Brooklyn Tech sort of parallels the Intel program though it is not copy cutting from them whereby uh, we bring in alumni who are experts in different areas of science to be co-mentors of the students as they conduct their research in 
the uh, in the high school lab as opposed to a university lab, and we've had some great successes with those kinds of pro programs. And I think Rich mm -hmm. had I have a, a real brief response, response, which is uh, you talk about communicating responsibilities. I, I think a key part of that is having institutional partnerships that that support the the science teacher partnerships. These partnerships can't depend just upon individuals. And if these individuals go away, the, the hope would be the partnerships continue. So there has to be an institutional relationship, and there has to be you know periodic communication between the institutions, between the university and the school district, for example. So that that to me is really essential communication among the institutional partners as well. And I, I don't think, as far as the responsibilities, the teacher needs to be the teacher, and the scientist needs to be the scientist, and you know the the. That the educator brings to the table, I think, is responsible for. Here's the pedagogy. Here's a, here's the way that you can communicate what it is that you're trying to communicate. Uh, the scientist needs to bring the pull the teacher into their world and say, here's what's happening. You know, take part in this research, not just do this for the sake of doing it. But no, you need to be part of this research team, uh, as because you are going to be you're you're valued. Uh, those of you that watch Star Trek, Deanna Troy, okay? What is she? She's the communications expert. And you know what? They never go into the uh, decision-making room without her because she's incredibly vital. That's what every research team in the country needs is a Deanna Troy. So that, <laughs> and what I'm saying is that then that person, uh, it becomes the, com helps them with the communication as well as with the research. But it's, it's truly a partnership. Like a brief comment I mean, from yeah, Dave, and then just, we'll go to the next yeah, question. Yeah, really quickly. This, you know, this is sort of a no-brainer, but I think time is a is a real uh, responsibility of all those <coughs> involved because to create these partnerships, it really does take a dedicated amount of time to meet and develop something that is effective. Um, so, having that scaled up at the institutional level provides um, the the structure and the framework so that that time can. Uh, can be taken and for educators um, that time has to do with giving up something there's uh, you, you have to you, there has to be a change of mindset you know I'm, we're, we're not going to be in presentation mode we're going to be in project mode or we're going to be in research mode and so that means uh, changing the paradigm a little bit the gentleman here was a question then we'll go to the gentleman there and then we'll go to the gentleman over here if you could again introduce yourself Hi, I'm Mike Kennedy. I'm a physics teacher from Neuqua Valley High School in Naperville, Illinois. I'm also a former Einstein fellow and former AX teacher. Uh, and the question I have for you is, with, with the recent budget cuts that 2012 saw, we saw a number of programs really uh, be cut back or, or eliminated. What, what kind of impact does that have for us in the near future? And then, what takes their place? What, what kind of things would you like to see take their place? Well, I mean, I guess as, as far as the, the numbers, um, I, I guess the, the two programs that have, we've talked about here that have been uh, um, off, are being phased out or terminated, GK-12 and, and ACTS, I think that probably a, a good number to use is you know, anywhere between 900 to 1,000 partnerships are, going to be, are not going to be there anymore. Uh, with these programs being phased out. So we're going to lose that many partnerships per year across the country. Um, I think that, that, you know, you look at uh, no program can be funded forever. I, I, I think that, you know, for example, with the, with the National Science Foundation and GK-12, you know, you, you just, NSF works at the, uh, you know, the steep part of the curve. They discover new things. I think it's, you know, phenomenal that NSF has supported this program for the years it has, and, and we've discovered this new model, and, and, and we've got this model down, and, and we're working on, you know, how do we get this model out there to be, you know, so that more, uh, whether it's private uh, industry or, or our education or private foundations or, you know, other federal agencies adopt this model f as, a, as, a, as a training program. Uh, that's something that's that's being being looked at, um, but there is definitely going to be a, vo a, a void. Uh, and this might be a, actually a really good opportunity uh, for Cy to just speak up real quick about uh, STEMnet and uh, you know, 
as, as one potential sort of idea where you have a liaison person uh, that actually bridges the gap and partners scientists or uh, the research community with education. And We're jumping ahead of that's all right, sir, for just a comment. Hi, I'm Sly Putmanathan. Um, I'm from the UK, and I actually work on a lot of um, a lot of schemes across the UK. And one in particular that I'm involved in as a STEM ambassador is um, STEMnet scheme, which is um, a government-run initiative for anyone that's working in the STEM professions to go into schools. So there is a liaison. Um, office and they're um, based in London and then there are regional points all over the UK and they liaise between the schools and a whole bunch of STEM ambassadors and we're all volunteers so we only get paid expenses to travel out to these schools um, and we have a minimum of like two events a year that we have to do um, in order to keep our sort of status active. And the thing is that whilst that's really um, useful in terms of people like myself, because we're really interested in doing this kind of thing, we carry on going into schools and we build up a relationship with the school itself. But there are others that just do it as a one-off um, event. So we've got a whole bunch of other, like even though this is um, run by the government, we have a whole bunch of other organisations that are taking on um, pushing it even further. So, for example, the Royal Society have um, partnership grants where they actually invest in the, it's about £300 that they will offer to a school and a teacher partnership. So, a school um, teacher and a scientist have to come together themselves and then apply for this funding and carry out a project. And this has actually resulted in eight, eight to ten year olds publishing a paper. Um, themselves, which has got figures that they've drawn themselves um, and everything. And it's just a wonderful piece of, um, it's a wonderful example of how young people can actually contribute to the body of scientific knowledge, even though um, they would never have thought about. The bumblebee? This is the bumblebee one, yeah. <laughs> Black Horton Bees, if you just Google that, you'll find Bo Lotto's paper that he did with young people. So, um, and then we have Teacher Scientist Network, which is run by um, the research councils. So there are lots of different organizations that are trying to push this even further so that they're not just one-off events, that they're actual um, long-term engagements with scientists and teachers. Um, but then we have so many databases as well, which offers teachers the opportunity to then um, link up with scientists of their own accord. So scientists that are local to them um, and to run their own projects, whatever they're looking for. And um, we were talking with the Undergraduate Ambassador Scheme yesterday, um, and they call it a win-win situation because you've got scientists, um, teachers, um, and the young people all gaining from this. There's no one, no one lacking in anything. Um, and from my own organisation, which is Ignite, um, we run, we actually give funding to young people um, to run their own lab within their school. So we've got three elementary schools and three high schools that have got their own lab space within their school that they run. So they, they learn management skills as well. So they've got a chairperson, a treasurer, a media and comms person. And like at the elementary school level, it is so cute. They're just, they're just all running these, um, running these labs themselves. And they have a scientist in residence. And what we found is that these scientists in residence, they're an expert in terms of um, in terms of their field, but they're also a facilitator for whatever the young people want to do and whatever they want to um, learn more about and potter and tinker and do their own experiments. Um, and now three out of the six scientists in residence want to go into teaching. Um, so in our um, country where we have like people who don't want to go into science teaching suddenly now wanting to go into teaching because they've had that real world experience and real um, real hands-on teaching, um, and they want to go into teaching. That's a great thing. So Are there similar kinds of STEM net uh, organizations or something that would parallel the teacher uh, scientist network uh, in other OECD countries, other European countries? Um, I'm not sure. I know that um, in Brussels there are some. Um, um, there are some scientists going into schools, but I don't know whether that's a formal network or whether it's something they've set up themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and in Italy, through um, 
it was through some contacts at the Genoan Science Festival, I found out that there's um, actual lab spaces within schools that they invite scientists in to come and talk. So there are bits and pieces happening all over Europe, but um, it's just finding out about them. Thank you very much. Let's go to the gentleman over here who had a question. Thank you. And then we have a gentleman over here. Yeah, I'm Dave Rabinowitz, and on a totally different tack, uh, Donnell mentioned that nowadays the students are more competent and comfortable with technology than the teachers tend to be. And they clearly did not learn that at school, and they probably didn't learn it from their parents. They learned it from each other and from television. And today, if you watch television, you know exactly what a surgeon looks like and what a surgeon does, what a criminal lawyer does, what a police officer does, things like that. You don't know what a scientist does. You don't see any scientists on TV, in uh, commercial television. Has anybody considered <clears throat> uh, using education funds to finance the development of commercial TV, uh, sitcoms, dramas, and such, Grey's Cosmology or something, uh, <clears throat> to get people really interested outside of school so that maybe the students can end up teaching the teachers what science is the way they're currently teaching them what Facebook is? I think the one exception to your question is forensic science, where because of uh, CSI and Bones and so forth, there's been an enormous increase in interest among college students in forensic science. But I think your, your uh, idea is, is very interesting. What does the panel think? Uh, yeah, I'll say it's, it's growing um, you know, in terms of the way that science, technology, engineering, and mathematics are being presented, um, specifically Sesame Street. Um, is taking a STEM focus this season, and they are making efforts to present engineering models such as students building a boat, um, science ta you know, processes, like how do you investigate something. That's being directed at our younger students in terms of being able to start that skill and curiosity building um, to, to promote a future STEM workforce. Danelle, is well, this the future in TV for you? or <laughs> No. <laughs> but being a physicist myself, uh, I, I would say there is as much opportunity as there is danger to television shows. And an example of that is Big Bang Theory, which I think is wickedly <laughs> funny. However, um, tends to, you know, continue to contribute to the stereotypes of the, you know, um, the physicist who cannot communicate and there are very few women and they are, you know, um, definitely not socially um, accepted and all of that. So I, I think, you know, there is a huge opportunity, but there's also some danger in perpetuating some of the stereotypes and some of the lack of recognition of yourself in that character. And so, you know, I would be excited to see more shows, but, but I also think that there is some danger in that as well. One, one more thing about that, you know, that on that technology piece, um, I, I'm not convinced that students really know how to use technology that well. They know how to push a lot of buttons and they feel very free to do that, but when it comes down to using technology um, for research or for application, they need a lot of training as well. And uh, so, so I think sometimes we see technology, as, you know, students getting ahead of it. Comfort level wise, yes, actual skills and training. I'm not so sure, and I want to come back to that. This whole, you know, thing about um, uh, TV and and uh, how we view scientists. <clears throat> this is one of the beautiful things about having graduate students in a classroom. I mean, you look at me and you look at Tim. Tim's a handsome guy, but <laughs> Thank you, Tim. but <laughs> I, I mean, I, you know, if 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 a graduate student comes in and they're wearing jeans and a T-shirt, they look an awful lot more like those students in the in in K-12 than we do, and the and the kids relate to that, and it builds a really strong connection. It's a way of engaging um, our youth, uh, you know, on the, on those two levels. The graduate students have a lot of enthusiasm for what they do. That's infectious, and then the 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 kids take that on. And it's not to say that that Tim and I can't develop um, an infectiousness about the science, but the more angles that you bring that from, uh, always the better. So that's another one of the benefits of bringing mm -hmm. the scientists into the schools. The gentleman here had a question. You can please identify yourself. Hello, I'm Michael Pacioni. I'm an Einstein Fellow at the National Science Foundation. And feeding off of what David said about bringing in different people into the classroom, I think we may need to look open this up even farther than just scientists but STEM professionals in general. 
the, uh, those partnerships are needed in schools to show students what they're capable of being, how they can be a professional. I've been a, a robotics instructor for six years, and those sustained partnerships with the engineers, the scientists, and the business people in our classrooms have really helped use project-based learning for our students to go from our countywide 74% graduation rate to the students that are now involved with our robotics program to a 100% graduation rate and a 99% uh, college enrollment rate. So those types of programs and the students being able to see themselves interacting and being professional, I think are some of the key things that we need to look for within education. So well, that sounds like we want to take the, uh, there's a gentleman there with a question, the partnership not only among the scientists, but also perhaps the people who are using science to say, uh, here's a career for you. I, I wondered if, in fact, in, some, in an age where the so-called shade tree mechanic is really obsolete, that the mechanic now is dealing with computers and advanced diagnostics and even, quote unquote, Joe's garage could be an inspiration in terms of how you're learning things in the classroom that have a very real application. I think it's important to use the word STEM researcher educator partnerships and it's not because it's not just the scientists. You've got engineers and engineers can can actually be uh, defined quite differently depending on who you're talking to. And you've got the technology experts and you've got the mathematicians as well. And along those lines as well, I just recently took my students to the Harvesting Clean Energy Conference in Boise and many of them were really um, intrigued to find out that this guy's a mechanical engineer, but he's also a farmer, and that there is a ton of technology and engineering and design, especially engineering, on those farms and ranches. And so, um, you know, I do think showing students that it's not just necessarily at a national lab or at a university, but it's everywhere is, is definitely important. The gentleman there with a question, the yeah. lady in the back. Jeff Schwartz from the Appalachian Regional Commission. We fund a lot of different programs, and I have a policy question for the panel as well as the groups here, it seems like many of you are serial participants where you go from the ACTS program to GK12 and whatnot. <laughs> the programs that we've fund, it's been a policy decision that once you participate, everybody else gets first dibs at the next one, that you participate once and then you step aside and let somebody else come into it again. How do you feel about that? Is it better to get a teacher or a student into several different programs to foster or nurture a small group or is it better to spread it out? It, I think it depends. Um, if, it, if it's a long-term program that is developed over a few years, so a participant has that uh, association over time to really be transformative, then I think you, I, I think it would be fine to say, yeah, it's time for you to move on for someone else to come in and benefit. Um, if they're a little shorter and sort of a, of a one-hit thing, uh, it might then having a chance to participate uh, over multiple sessions I think is is a benefit and I I would also like to add that it depends on the on the subject matter for example when I did the program at Columbia University I worked in a chemistry lab and uh, I developed precursors of antidotes which can be used against nerve gases now at NYU Poly I want to update my skills in mechatronics and fluid dynamics, and that's what I'm doing with a program at NYU Poly, and I am transmitting that to the students, whereby my students are uh, adopting mechatronics and fluid dynamic approaches to the research that they're doing in alternative energy. In fact, we have been able to uh, develop a new subdiscipline, which we keep advancing year after year. And I saw the need for us to have mechatronics and fluid dynamics input. And NYU Poly was the ideal place for me to go again to teach what I practice to the students instead of just sitting down as a mentor and letting them do it, I practice it myself. I lead by example instead of just simply saying, you know, you do, th you do this or you do that. I also incorporate it 
as part of my research. I think it's Im important to go ahead and, and have that intensive experience to create the teacher-scientist hybrid. But then beyond that, I think it's also important to have, they don't have to be as comprehensive types of experiences, but additional opportunities for a teacher throughout their profession to continue to link and partner with the scientific community or the STEM research community. Let's go to the lady, and then there was a gentleman right next to her. And let me take both of the, and a lady here, and then we'll take, make those the last three questions. I want to give the panel a, a last, uh, an opportunity for a last word. Hi, Aline McNall, American Institute of Physics. I wanted to ask uh, your thoughts on the students that are functioning maybe below grade level. You mentioned benchmarks and reaching them in the classroom and how that's such a challenge. Um, in, in a lot of classrooms, the students are functioning a few levels below where the benchmarks are actually stated and, and what types of benefit these, this um, partnership could have to those students that are, are that category of student, I guess. Let's take the three questions, the next two questions, and then we'll have the panel respond. The gentleman there. Hi. Uh, Mike McCart, Institute of International Education. Um, there's obviously a lot of resources uh, in the U.S., and I appreciate the information about STEMnet to see an example of what's happening in the U.K. Uh, my question is if there's an effort, or more importantly, if you see value in looking internationally for potential partnerships, uh, potential resources, to, um, to bring that international component into scientific research, and maybe specifically looking at countries that are recognized as being very strong in STEM education through PISA exams or, or other methods. And there was a lady here. Oh, you wanted to have another second word? There's a lady up here that, uh, oh. <laughs> hey, sorry. Well, I don't want to get in trouble with the ladies, so I'm <laughs> <laughs> I grabbed the mic. <laughs> I'm Marie Gleason Totter, and I'm an Einstein Fellow, and I'm working with the Office of Education at NASA. And my opportunity to learn about the Einstein Fellowship came through the RET. And uh, the research Tell everyone experience what the for RET teachers. Is. The research experience for teachers. And it was part of the CPATH program uh, through an NSF grant. And I found it extremely effective, but the universities were required to uh, partner with a K-12 institution. Now, if they're not being required to, I'm wondering if we will have that long-term involvement in the schools and uh, why take away a program that really works. We had one last question. Hi, I'm Carmelina Livingston. I'm an Einstein Fellow and an elementary science teacher in Charleston, South Carolina. I have, for many, many years, have used the scientific uh, scientist um, teacher partnership and one of the programs that I do this through is um, the COSI network which is Center for the Ocean Sciences for Excellence in Education and uh, my question is to the researchers or the scientists the COSI actually supports scientists and research on how to make that connection in the classroom so my question is to the panel uh, what other support systems uh, or are there other support systems to support the researchers and how to be effective in the classroom um, with the students and the teachers? Great, thank you. This is a terrific set of questions. Let's go to number one. What about the low performing student? I have to say, as far as some of the students that I've had the opportunity to work with, um, just the experience of being able to link it to something that's cutting edge and relevant in a lot of ways has instigated their curiosity and their drive within themselves so that, like I said, instead of necessarily studying some of these benchmarks as from a historical aspect, they're able to see the relevancy in their own lives. Um, that's been the best way that I've found to reach some of those students who have written themselves off as I'm not a scientist, I'm not a mathematician, this isn't meant for me, is that if you can find those ways to incorporate what's <coughs> happening now, as well as how it impacts their daily lives and create that context for them. I have to say, personally speaking, I've had a lot of success with students being able to reach those 
who weren't interested. And I have to say that my ability to make those connections and create that context came from being able to participate in a laboratory-based experience for teachers. I'm going to go ahead and, and follow up on that because I, I, I come from Oil City, uh, which is one of the 10 poorest school districts in the state of Pennsylvania, and we have about 500 school districts. So that kind of gives you a sense of where we are. Um, you know, what I have found over the years is that the reason <coughs> many, for the most part, the reasons why so many kids write themselves off is that they don't, they don't see, they don't see <coughs> a usefulness for what they're doing. They don't see the application. They don't, uh, it's like, look, you know, why am I doing what I'm doing? And, and they, they don't see that. And kids in, in, in Oil City and many other places are struggling with <coughs> issues that I never thought about growing up. And I'll give you an example. One of my students, space science, um, she ended up, in, and we had an uh, opportunity to participate in the Spitzer Space Science Research Program for Teachers and Students. It's a NASA-sponsored event, or project, thank you very much. Uh, it was phenomenal. What it did is it took teachers and uh, and put students on the teachers team and <coughs> place them with a national group of other teachers and students and a mentor scientist for a year and we did a full-fledged real-world astronomical research project we were hunting young stars titari stars uh, and we were making discoveries danielle went from um she was in my space science class, went from two Fs, and she won't mind me saying that, to an A, and to taking first place in the Pittsburgh Regional Science and Engineering Fair, beating out kids from Fox Chapel from all of the top schools. That's what it can do. Well, I, I want to just, I'm afraid we won't get to all the questions, okay. and maybe no, add that to your wrap-up question. I just want to go to the, what about learning from overseas? That, if you look at the, uh, Horace, we'll start with you, but look at the, the performance on the PEACE exam, and the U.S. would have to be chanting, we're 24th, which is not what we <laughs> uh, The program with Columbia has been able to link up with high schools and scientists in Australia and countries like Singapore, where the students are more interested in learning science and they do very well in mathematics and science. And whereby some teachers who are in the research program at Columbia actually go over to Australia, work in labs with Australian scientists or <coughs> scientists in Singapore, and also work with the students in those countries and teachers from those countries come over and participate in the program at Columbia University as though they are American high school uh, students. So that's one example of uh, the internationalizing, if you want to use that terminology, of, uh, of the research program. No. You know, and along the lines of international collaboration, I think that we're not serving our students well if we're not showing them that science is global. You know, I, I think that it's vitally important to show them not only that, yes, we're doing this oftentimes for homeland security and, 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 and innovation on the home front, but also um, that these are global challenges we're facing in terms of energy resources and uh, development in general. And so, um, you know, showing them that, that science is international and bring that into the classroom as much as you can, I think, is, is definitely important. And, and also looking at those countries for examples of what they're doing that's working in education and science and, and STEM development is, is important as well. I'd like to jump in and say, suggest that possibly that these high test scores don't necessarily mean that the students in these countries better understand the process of science, though. Mm -hmm. I think we have to be careful about that. Uh, yeah. My guess is there aren't really great metrics for measuring the degree to which a student understands the nature of the process of science. And so I don't think we should assume that those high test scores mean that, mean that they're doing it right, necessarily. Right. Let's go to the, the third question, that uh, without the requirement that universities participate with the K through 12 schools, will they continue to do so? 
I'd like to suggest a model. More graduate STEM programs in the U.S. are developing the option of teaching certificates for STEM graduate students. It's a growing model in the U.S., and I think that a partnership with a school could be an element of a teaching certificate program for STEM graduate students. Is this something along the line of the UTeach program? Yeah, similar, right? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Let's go to the last uh, question. The, uh, what other support mechanisms might there be along the lines of the OCEAN program? So, l l let me try that. Uh, Carmelina, I'm, I'm understanding your question as uh, what do we do to facilitate preparation of the scientists uh, in terms of their ability to, to, but, uh, but to be educators. And um, yeah, this, this gets back to uh, uh, what I talked about at the very start, that there really isn't a lot of incentive there. Um, researchers, the incentive is really publication in their field and uh, funding in the form of, uh, of securing grants. <clears throat> so um, th there, have, there have been a couple of, of uh, notable examples. And actually, in, in some ways, this is a fairly young field. Maybe since the 90s, there was a, a, a guy by the name of Ernst Boyer who, who um, challenged the professoriate about what it really means to be um, a, a quality academic. And so rather than just uh, doing discovery research, he um, challenged people to look at teaching and learning and to also look at applied research. And so uh, some of the challenges that exist there, of course, is that if, if the promotion system is all about discovery research, um, it, there's no real incentive for these researchers to be prepared. Um, so I'm going to take this a little different direction now. Carl Wyman recently has done some really interesting work through the Office of Science and Technology Policy. He's a Nobel laureate. But he's really looking at uh, teaching and learning research, um, how people learn. There was a great publication by the National Academy of Sciences with, with that title. And he's looked at that research and uh, has experimented with that and asked um, uh, undergraduate educators in the sciences to look at models of teaching and learning that have shown really promising results in terms of engaging students, helping them develop better conceptual models, and retaining them in sciences. Well, this has been a terrific set of questions. I want to give the panel, and I apologize, we are actually past our witching hour. This shows how interesting the panel's been and how many good questions we've had. So I'm going to start with Richard and, and give everyone on the panel a, uh, a neo-tweet opportunity, a two-sentence summing up. I guess uh, my last comment would be I think we need to focus at the elementary level. It's where students start, and I think that's where we have the greatest need for um, better preparing teachers to, to promote learning of science, and I think that's where I focus my efforts at the elementary level. Tim? I think that um, uh, for many reasons, including national security, including the, the health of our nation, if we don't bring to bear all available resources to the development and the support of the, uh, of the partnerships between STEM educators and STEM researchers and bridge this gap between how science is taught in the classroom and how it's practiced in the real world, I think that there will be severe consequences down the road. And just building on Tim's statement, if we want students who are going to be competitive, not just within the current forecast for the STEM job force here in the United States, but on an international level, having teachers helping lead the way through these types of experiences and partnerships is a good investment. Yeah, and and um, I'm gonna I'm gonna chime in with the choir here. Uh, there. We hear over and over and over again how important it is for us to catch up uh, in terms of our, our STEM enterprise and STEM expertise. Uh, this is an all-hands-on-deck uh, kind of uh, in engagement and time. And so asking researchers to participate uh, in the education of our K-12 students is essential. I would agree with all that has been said before, but I would say that this, 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 the one of the vessels 
for that connection between uh, STEM at the university level and in the high school are the students themselves. And uh, we need to continue to give them the support and the encouragement and the sustenance either through paid fellowships as they would get in internships and other means of getting them to be hooked into science because without them uh, <coughs> where would we be and where would the where will the future of science be but now Additionally, I think, um, you know, in a time when teachers feel like they're being attacked at every level, it's programs like these that garner a little bit more respect for teachers and certainly would encourage them um, to stay in the field of teaching where, you know, it's very difficult year in and year out to choose to be a teacher when you have a STEM degree that allows you to, to do a variety of other things, most of which pay much better than your current profession. So. I think that's another important aspect of these programs that hasn't been touched on, that it really um, increases teacher retention in the sense that it's garnering a, a bit more respect for teachers, and that's very important, especially in today's um, environment for teachers. Well, adding a thought to uh, what Danelle has just said, I think we've made a, a mistake here by focusing so much on what we think are identify as failures or individual teachers that are not doing all that they should and we really need to also celebrate success and that's one of the things I've learned by having had a number of meeting with the Einstein fellows and the kind of people that we have on the panel today. Tim, thank you for bringing this to my attention. This has been thank I think you. a very rich discussion. Thank you panel. Very interesting comments. I think you've educated certainly a, a number of us and thank you uh, for a, such a series of good questions. Please join me in a round of applause for Patrick.